All right, Seth is back to give us a talk and a little bit of a training on summary statistics in Bro. So, so this is a very similar talk for people that have been here last year, actually. But I, I know there's a lot of new faces, so that I think this is worthwhile because this is actually kind of a big, surprisingly complicated topic. Um, uh, so the, the presentation is really the same, but the, there is an exercise that goes along with it. But the exercise is probably a little scary if you just sit down and look at it, because it just says, here's some big blocks of junk, run them. So uh, what I'm actually going to be doing is some live development. Hopefully it works out. Um, but first, summary statistics. What they, uh, what they really are is it, as you can read, it basically is a bunch of observations. And then you apply some math or, or something on that series of observations to sort of condense the information. And you can think of summing, just adding up a, you know, a, a billion numbers a sum of those numbers is a summary statistic. But there's other things like variance and standard deviations. But there's a lot of different things that you can derive from that. And I, I should also say this is, um, actually, raise your hand if you even know what I'm talking about if I say the metrics framework. OK, so less than half the room. So this is mostly newer users then. Um, there, was, there used to be a thing in Bro 2.0 and 2.1 called the metrics framework. But this is the same thing pushed way further down the road and renamed. Um, so there were a bunch of motivations for it. Like uh, on a cluster, the, the old model for writing bro scripts was you would write them. And if you needed to add up numbers, you just keep a variable and add them up. And it was really easy. But then everyone started doing this clustering thing. And suddenly, that doesn't work anymore because you've got you know, if, if you have a variable, you actually now have 10 copies of that variable on separate processes. So you're like, well, OK, adding doesn't work anymore. And now my problem has become ridiculously hard. So there's kind of this thing where we're like, OK, there's, there's got to be an abstraction here that we can provide that helps you count things. But it works transparently on a cluster. And then there's also this, uh, this notion of have, having an actual repeatable interface for, um, for different types of measurement that you might want to do. And um, it, it also gives you the ability to do some of this stuff on, in production. Frequently, there's a big difference. If you knock out a script and you run it on like some, a PCAP, you can get that to work. But it's frequently a very different task to try and get that running in production, like on, on a very large cluster. But frequently, if you're writing a fairly simple sum stat thing that like measures something, um, you can write a toy example and then immediately go and deploy that on real traffic. And, and case in point, we actually have some sites. I, I wrote a thing that would calculate, and this is jumping ahead a little bit, but I wrote a script that would calculate the top 10 DNS names being looked up. Which, if you think about it, say you have 10, like not a 10 gig link, but 10 gigabits per second of traffic. How do you do that? That's like an incredibly hard thing. But it's actually something that you can write that looks like a toy script, but then you can immediately go and put it in production, and it actually works. Uh, it, has anyone run that script? Or the one I'm talking about that does top K for? Okay, I know one person. He's nodding, didn't even raise his hand. Um, but it did work, right? It worked. It was, a, it was like a 10-minute script, and it worked. So it kind of validated this, this approach. But the approach is sort of this epic-based thing where you say an epic is just a range of time. So you have epic, epic, epic. So you're saying, let's say, five-minute epics. So you measure something over that five minutes, and then it's done. And then you do something with that, you know, that, that top 10. Or you do something with that, um, that sum. Or you do something with that whatever. But then, you know, at the, you, then it starts measuring again. And it gets to the end of the next epic. And you do something again. Um, only streaming algorithms are allowed. So um, if you're doing a summation, we don't keep all the numbers and then add them up at the end. I mean, that sort of seems sort of silly, because if you're, let's say you have 10 trillion numbers, that's actually going to take a lot of memory. It's sort of unreasonable to even think of holding that in memory. So what you actually do is it's, it's pretty straightforward for summing. You just are like. Just keep adding them up. And you know, I, all I keep is my total, and I just keep adding the new numbers to it. So at the end, 
you really only ever have one number. You just keep adding the number to it. So that's sort of the base idea of a streaming algorithm is that it's something that you don't need your entire data set to scan over back and forth. It's one run through and you never look back. All the measurements have to be mergeable. So think about this. If you're doing the very simple example of summing, you can sum, let's say, let's say for load balancing, you, you split your data stream, so you have a stream of numbers coming in and they go to two different processes. You can sum these numbers. You can also sum these numbers. Mergeable, or um, the, the word, the, technically the word is actually composable, so to actually compose those, what do you do? You just add the two numbers, like how hard is that? So it's very easy. That same approach actually can apply to a lot of other algorithms. The top K algorithm, which um, Johanna implemented out of um, an academic paper, I think one Sunday, right? You just sat down and, because I remember Monday came around and all of a sudden, hey, I've got this thing. <laughs> it's, it's kind of magic when you use it. It's pretty neat. But there, there's like that and there's um, standard deviation and variance and all of these things, they have mechanisms to merge them. They're not quite as simple as just add the numbers, but they're, they're pretty straightforward. Um, the other one is uh, we actually have some probabilistic data structures. So right now we have hyper log log and top K. The top K one, is, so it's not an exact top K, like the top 10 DNS name, top 100 DNS name, top, uh, top uh, yeah, let's say you could even measure something like the top headers, the top header types seen in HTTP. And you could even split it and say, by you know slash twenty four on my network, or you know by local stuff going to the internet, or internet stuff coming in, you could do weird stuff like the top ten you know header types. And this is all stuff that would actually work in production in, lar in large scale. So it actually gives you top k. It's not exact, but it tells you how inexact it is because it does measure the the error. Um, and, and, and frequently in, I, sh I guess I should also finish that by saying in, in production, we've frequently seen that the error is somewhere between no error and extremely minimal error. Um, but you, the, by giving yourself that error, you actually get the ability to do this. If you did it exact and kept everything in memory, you, you would just blow out memory on your box really quickly. Hyperloglog -log is the same thing, but it's for cardinality. So let's say you, let's say you wanna know the number Here's a good example, I guess. Let's say you have 10 trillion numbers. You want to know how many unique numbers there were in that. Maybe there's, maybe there's 5 trillion unique numbers in that list of numbers. That's kind of hard to, to measure that. Hyperloglog -log actually gives you the ability to say, I'm trading some margin of error for the ability to do this at all. So it, it actually, and it's, it is a, these are both data structures that support composition or merging. And um, they're, they're both data structures that the trade-off is a little bit of error for the possibility of doing it. So the real question is, why do you even do this? It's because it's really fun. It's fascinating to find out some of the stuff about your network, because it's one of those things where, you know, yesterday you couldn't know this stuff about your network. There's no commercial products that you can buy that answer these things. Maybe you could shove tons and tons of data into a database or, or Splunk or something, and it could churn on that for a while and give you an answer. This is like live answers. It can give you this answer over every hour, like the top 10 DNS lookups per hour, the top 10 host header types per hour, or sorry, the top 10 um, HTTP headers per hour. Um, and it just can do that ongoing. You can measure this over a day or a week, and, and all sorts of, um, uh, it, it works. That's, that's the most like, phenomenal thing about this, is it actually works. And it, it works in real time. So like at the end of that hour, it measured over that hour, and right at the end of it, you get the answer. There's no churning on the data because it's done at the end of the hour. It's, it's already finished. So we have um, some notices, and, and this is an older slide, so this is like a repeat. So 2.2 had these, but now 2.3 also has them. So if you load, um, I don't know what scripts these are coming from. You'd have to actually search. Uh, these two are actually coming from scan.bro. So you can see the kind of data that it actually gives you. This, this is hard, really hard information to collect in many cases. And in most other, I don't know of another tool that will give you this data. So it's saying that this IP address scanned at least because it is, this is using a probabilistic data structure to measure it. 
at least 20, oh, sorry, actually, I take that back. This is not using a probabilistic data structure, but it is on a cluster. So there is some question about, like, by the time we told you, it may have actually scanned more. So it's at least this many. So it says, scanned at least 29 unique hosts on this port in one minute and four seconds. It's fascinating to see this stuff, because how different is this one? This host scans 60, at least 64 unique hosts on port 443 in one second. That's mass. Sorry? That's mass it's not. This is before mass scan existed. Um, uh, so, and it also, the scan.bro also does ports. If, if you look at the, the new scan.bro, it's actually really short. The, talk to Ashish about it if you really want to hear about all the differences. He was a, a big component in the new scan.bro. He was one of the people that probably had more lessons to learn from the old one than anyone. But, um, so the new one is heavily informed and um, relies on some stats to do its thing because you know, if you're doing scan detection on a cluster, it turns out that's one of the hardest things you could hope to do, actually. Um, but it works, and it actually works efficiently. Everyone that's running, so anyone here that's running bro with bro control D, or, or sorry, <laughs> bro control, and has not um, explicitly turned it off, you're doing the scan detection. It's probably not causing that much overhead on your system. You probably don't even really know that your system is doing all of this stuff, but it's actually measuring this stuff all the time. Um, and we use it for some other things, like this one. And that this stuff is so hard to measure in many cases, but like the top one, that host had 349 failed logins on two FTP servers in 14 minutes, 47 seconds. This was not digging into database. This was not looking back in time. This was doing forward moving measurements continuously, and it said, oh, a threshold was crossed, and, and so I'm gonna tell you about it. So, the way, this is kind of the, the overview of how it works. You start at the top, and you have to, you have to observe something first. Like, my example I was giving of, um, like, top DNS requests, right? That's your observation. You're, you're saying, I'm, I'm observing that something did a DNS request. I'm observing that I saw a host header because I wanted to do something with host headers in HTTP. I'm observing the type of HTTP request, get, post, that kind of stuff. So these are all like point observations. It's just a, a single point, which, which is not very helpful in itself, which is why you move down, because what you really want to get is all that data into one thing at the end so you can come to some conclusion. So, the observations actually feed into these things called reducers. There's a paper that is being um, published at RAID. The, it's not called RAID anymore. It's a conference that changed its name. It used to be called Recent Advances in Intrusion Detection. But um, the paper explains the system, and it's essentially a modified map reduce. So you guys, load balancing your traffic is mapping. So it's distributing this, this computation. And then we have reducers where the reduction happens, and then some stat actually can just take multiple reducers to do some more stuff. So it's sort of a modified map reduce. But in the map reduce, all these observations come in here, and they actually are calculating the sum, the average, the top k, all of this different stuff. But then you can think this is bro process one, this is bro process two. This is where the merging of those data structures come in. So when you have sum and sum, you actually have two sums, but I mean, that's easy to add it and get the yet your total sum at the bottom. So you've actually taken millions and millions and millions of observations and reduced it to one number, which is neat. I mean, that, that's kind of cool to be able to do it, especially because it works across physical hosts and across uh, processes. So I actually described all this already. I actually want to hurry up and get through the rest of this and get to the programming part. But so observations, like I said, an HTTP request, a DNS lookup. It could even be, you know, the host, the observing a host header in an HTTP lookup. Like, that could be an observation. An ICMP message. Oh, actually, I think the reason I put ICMP message in there, there's a script in Bro right now, and I don't know if it loads by default with, uh, with the, just installing with Bro control. It does trace route detection, and it uses some stats because um, there the various packets that are involved in correlating to see if trace routes are being run could be seen on different hosts on a cluster, and some stats provides us a way to, to centralize that data. But it actually will detect people running trace route, and it's really neat because I implemented it in a, a couple of hours. 
And um, I don't know of any tools that do this right now, except for Bro. But it will actually log who was doing the trace route, the address that the trace route was at. So if you run traceroute google.com, it'll tell you that your address ran trace route. It'll tell you that whatever address resolved for google.com was the destination. And it will tell you that it was an ICMP trace route, or that it was a TCP trace route, or that it was a UDP trace route, which it's interesting. It's interesting to see who does trace route on the internet. You see a lot of uh, CADA stuff from whatever university that's from in Indiana, uh, Purdue, I think. Um, but you'll see there, there's a lot of trace route floating around on the internet. But it's not easy, because you're actually there's a number of packets that you have to look into and sort of correlate bits and pieces out of all of these to actually come to a conclusion. But, but the, the sum stats actually made it easy to do this, which was interesting. That was sort of where it became interesting to me, was I was like, I don't know how this is useful, but people can run it, and it doesn't really cause much you know, overhead on their systems. And who knows? It's interesting to have the data. It's one of those forensic things. You know, it, it's not useful until it solves everything. Um, and if it doesn't cause much overhead, there's not much to worry about with it. Oh, I must have had a point at the bottom that I forgot about. Um, so reducers, <laughs> yes, I reduced it. Reducers collect observations and apply calculations to them, like I said earlier. It's, it's fairly straightforward conceptually, so you don't need to worry about it too much. Sum of content length headers. That, that's, a, that's a weird example, but who knows? I mean, that's going to maybe tell you the, the total amount of data that a web server is claiming that it was applied with. Um, unique number of DNS requests. That's one of the examples we'll go through. So then the sum stat is kind of the very bottom level. And it's really kind of the integration of the sort of higher level conceptual map reduce activity down to the hard reality of how do I integrate this back into a bro script and make it do things that are interesting for me. So a sum stat is essentially um, you, take, you attach reducer A, one or more reducers to it, which have you know, been calculating stuff. And you, you get to apply callbacks so that it says, oh, here's how to figure out a threshold value. Or here's how to, um, here's the threshold I want to trigger on. And here's a callback. Execute this code if the threshold gets crossed. Or when the epic is done, for each result value, call this chunk of code. Like that kind of stuff. So it kind of, puts you, you know, back into reality and out of this sort of higher level measurement stuff. And I'm going to skip that second point. That, that's kind of a complicated point. I don't think we're going to do that in the exercise. Um, but you can do things like calculate ratios uh, between, so you could be calculating multiple things, multiple reducers, and actually set thresholds on ratios of those. So you can imagine unique DNS requests and unique host names a ratio of those for a per host on your network. It's the kind of stuff that I don't know of any tools that do these sorts of things easily and, and memory efficiently out of the, and, and are things that you can actually run on large amounts of traffic. So that's the main point, though, the bottom one. They handle results from reducers and do something. So again, you observe things, you calculate things, you do things. Observe, calculate, do. For some reason, I just suddenly now realize that's actually kind of a good way to structure that. Observe, calculate, do. So now I need to figure out how to get my screen. OK, so maybe you guys have the, the exercise for this. We're not having like a waiting time. To 
we're not having like a, a waiting time. And what I'm going to do is go through because I think there's some value in actually saying, well, I have this problem I want to solve. I want to know the number of unique DNS requests being made. How do I actually approach this with some stats? Because if you look at the exercise, what time do I go till? Uh, uh, 10.45. All right. If you look at the exercise, it's a big blob of code. And there's some description around it. But I, I think there's some value in actually talking through some of this a little bit. So exercise one, the point of it is really that we want to say um, the, our, our problem, which we're setting out at the beginning, is we want to know the number of unique DNS lookups per requester. So we have traffic, and lots of hosts are doing DNS requests. And we want to say, how many unique ones did each one of those did? Did each one of those do? Weird people when you say that. Um, so anyway, that's, that's frequently with some stats where you have to start. You have to say, what, am, what do I want to answer? And then it, it's kind of a nice, easy next step, because the next step you have to say is, well, what do I need to observe in order to answer that? And in this case, what you need to observe is DNS requests. So we have this convenient um, DNS request event. The, uh, and I'll just type in really quick the, can everybody see that? Okay. <clears throat> so for DNS request, it gets a connection it gets a record that is the DNS message, the query, which is a string, the query type, which is a number, or count, the query class, which is also a count. OK, so now we're in here. And now what we need to do is say, well, OK, we're, we have the event handler. Now we need to actually observe it. So there's a call for that. And I, I should say also, this is generally, even though the base stuff, the, the base, everything in base is normally loaded by default, it's still usually good practice to go ahead and load it anyway. Um, just because someone could, ro could run bro in a mode where the base stuff is not loaded. So if you do this, then you're sort of ensured that your script will actually work. So that's kind of nice. Um, so anyway, we're going to say, uh, we're going to do if, uh, if c$id, if the rest port is not equal, oh, I'm sorry. If it e we want it to equal 53 UDP. And that's just because um, the NetBIOS name service, we actually pass through the DNS analyzer. So you get response, it queries and responses on essentially NetBIOS DNS names. So you get Windows boxes doing name resolution internally. So we're, we're trying, trying to just limit this to say we're only real interested in actual DNS here. And we actually want to make sure that there, there is, in fact, a query. So we'll say if, if the query is not nothing. So we want something to be in there. Um, now we have to actually observe, um, observe something. So we observe, and this is um, an arbitrary name. You can think of it like uh, the observation stream. So like I said earlier, you've got this big stream of numbers, or, but in this case, it's a big stream of observations coming in. You have to actually name that stream, because it's going to, for every DNS request, granted, that matches the condition, it's going to feed it into this stream. And so you're just saying, I need to attach to that with my reducer. So here's the name of the stream. So DNS lookup is just arbitrary name. You don't have to do the dot. You can name it whatever you want. Um, so DNS lookup. Now we have a key. So this is where this, I think, is slightly different from some other MapReduce type things. Whoop. So what the key represents is what this observation is about. Because you're saying that what we're doing is we're actually, we want to say, we want to know the number of unique requests being done by host x. The key is the by. So we're saying by host x. So we actually say that the key is this. And you, 
the, the syntax is a little funny, but you can look into it, and there are other examples around, uh, around this key and how you can use it in some other ways. But for now, we'll just kind of skip over that. It's not worth going into too much. But in this case, because this is a DNS lookup and we need to know unique ones, so if someone looks up google.com, we need to know that they looked up google.com. So the observations in this case within them have a string, and it's not like a number. So we're actually measuring strings in some sense. So we'll just go ahead and assign the query there. So that's all it is. Th this has created our observation. Actually, I'm going to drag that over some. This has created our observation stream. So that's the top level, you know, of the, the one with all the things, and they go down to reducers, and then they go down to some stats. So this is the, the very top level. We're just creating an observation stream. So if I go and I do bro, read, exercise traffic, um, some stats one. Isn't that exciting? Absolutely nothing happens. The reason is that the observations don't do anything by themselves. They go into the some stats observation code, and the code goes, well, nothing's using these, and just throws them out. So let's use them. Let's create a reducer. I tend to, I, I, never, I don't think this would work outside of an, an event handler. I never really write any code outside of event handlers because Bro still has some inconsistency with how it handles that. So if I ever do, it's like a super simple if statement or something. Um, generally, all the things that I do are within event handlers. So let's go ahead, first of all, and create a local variable named R1, and that'll be a reducer. And we use a special syntax for record construction that does this. And we're actually going to say that it's attaching to the observation stream that is named DNS lookup. So there we go. We have, we have successfully created a reducer that attaches to the DNS lookup observation stream. That's still not enough, though, because we haven't told it what to do. Like, it, it's not going to do anything. It's like, great, I've, I've, oh, no, I typed that wrong. That's reducer. So that's still not doing anything, though, because just attaching to the stream doesn't mean anything. We have to tell it um, that we want it to, to actually calculate something. Or in this case, we want it to apply a calculation. So we apply, and this is a set of, of calculations because you could attach, you could do variance and unique, and it, it would actually do both at the same time within the one reducer and give you both results at the end. So the special thing is some stats unique. So now what we're saying is, hey, reducer, attach to the, to the DNS lookup observation stream, apply the unique calculation, which is defined actually kind of in a plugin in some stats, apply that to the stream. So we can still, we, let's see if, it, if I actually typed everything right. So we can still run that, but nothing's going to happen because remember there is the observe, calculate, or observe, whatever I said, the middle one, observe, calculate, and then do. We haven't hit the do part yet, so it's not actually doing anything. So we have to, at this point, actually create a sum stat. So we've, we've successfully now created an observation here. We've linked the observation into the reducer, so we're at the next level. Now we have to link the reducer into a sum stat. So for that, it's actually sum stats. There is a create function. And we give it a name because we want to be able to reference it later on for Uh, in case we want to make changes to it or, or make it stop working or like turn it off dynamically and things like that. So we have a name. We also, this is where we assign an epoch to it. So let's say we want our epoch to be six hours. So it measures these things over six hour periods. And at the end of each six hours, it outputs the number of um, unique DNS requests. No, sorry, it doesn't do that. It calls a callback with the result. And it's up to you to actually decide to do something with it. So the next thing we have to do is actually attach our reducers. And it's reducers because it could be more than one. But we just do that because we only have one reducer right now. So now we have successfully observed something, 
attach that to a reducer, and I'll attach the reducer to a sum stat. But there's a little more, because this still is not going to do anything, because we haven't told it what to do. It's, so it, it'll do all the calculation, and it'll get to the end of the six hours, and then it'll say, <laughs> I guess that's it. You didn't tell me to do anything. So let's make it do something. Um, so there's this callback, and this, this is actually a little funny because it's a special syntax, um, but it, what this is doing is it's saying that there's a field in this record named epic result, and I'm going to attach a function to it with the prototype of, well, I'll type in the prototype, the, the, the fields that it accepts, or th sorry, that, that it provides you. So there's this sum stats key. So what the sum stats key is, is this value. And keep in mind, because we provided a key it's actually not calculating like the top DN it's not calculating unique DNS requests for your network. It's calculating unique DNS requests for every single host that is making DNS requests. This is probably not something this will kill your machine with, with uh, memory will kill you. But you could start doing things like your if statement here could do something like only if it's local, if only if it's a local host making the lookup. So suddenly you've said, Anything outside my network, it, it, in, I know many of you actually run like authoritative DNS servers on your network, so you do see a lot of outside lookups coming into your network. And um, so you could, you could limit this and say only you know, my local host making DNS requests. And you could limit it even further by saying you know, it, has to be a recur it has to be requesting recursion or something like that um, and not doing an authoritative lookup. So the key is, is that value, so you actually know what this is about. It's, it's about that host that was doing the lookup. Um, and then you actually have your result, which is a data structure, and you can go to the sum stats code and look at what's in this data structure. It may have, it should be on the, the auto-generated documentation, too, on the website. So sum stats result, it's not very hard. Um, and because Because this is a function, we get the ability to you know, write some code here. And we can assume that these are the values that we have to work with. We have a timestamp for when the data was collected, the, sort of the end of the epic timestamp. We know the key. So this gets called a lot of times. Like for every single host it has results for, it'll call this, this function over and over and over again. And we have the result. It's a little hard to sort of reach outside of this and get other information, but that is technically possible to do that. Um, so anyway, moving forward, we just say, what do we want to do? We actually have to go and get, uh, the, get the result we're interested out of the result, because if you attach multiple reducers, you'll actually have multiple result values, for, like a result value for each reducer. So we have to, we're just going to go ahead and do this, um, because this is the reducer. We're interested in the reducer that we attached to the DNS lookup stream. So now we've got that result. And, and let's actually, you know what? What would be more interesting, because I think that a lot of people aren't going to know that. So what if we just do this? Let's just, just print result. It's going to look nasty, but it'll inform you as to what's available even. So we'll see. Actually, I have no idea what's going to happen here, but let's try it. OK. So you can see, so that's at the end, it's sort of trash data, but here is a, wait, sorry. Here is a result value. So what the, it, the result value, you can see, it has this DNS lookup string. So that's why I was doing, it's why I was doing this to say, in the result, get the DNS lookup, the thing that is um, indexed on DNS.lookup. So then you can actually, sitting here, you can see all the fields you have available. So you can say dns.lookup dollar unique vowels, and it gives you actually these values. So you start seeing, oh, I'm sorry, the key will be there somewhere too. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't print the key, so you won't see that. Let's keep moving though. So now you, you can kind of get the idea that you can play. Like you're not sure what to do, but just print the result, just see what's there, and then you can kind of work from there. It's the 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 way of dealing with something that, with data structures like this without actually looking at documentation. But that's no excuse for us not to have better documentation. 
So we've got, we've got that result value that has all the information in it. It has the, it, it has the, the result of the calculation. It has all the unique values. You can you know, find out how many unique values are in there. So we're going to go ahead and actually write a, a print statement. So we'll do print format. So some host did some number, so, some total number, and some number of unique DNS requests in the last six hours. So you can kind of see this is kind of digging back to what those notices looked like in the presentation earlier, where the notices would have all this information, like with the time period and, and, and other, other stuff. You can actually do this even more generically than, say, in the last six hours. You could actually dig back into your uh, sums data, I believe, and there's, there's several ways you could do it, but you could actually dig back and say, what was my epic? So you could just change it in one place, and it would just end up here. So uh, host did some number total and some number of unique DNS requests in the last six hours. Let's put a period at the end and make it a real sentence. So now I need to actually fill in that format string. I need to actually fill in the fields. So host. So what I'm actually looking for is the key dollar host. So now that fills in this field. Some particular host did some number total, which is going to be result dollar, I think sum. Oh, sorry, num. Num is, is the total number of observations that were fed in. And it's not something you need to even calculate because everything, you, it's just you have to know the number of unique, of observa the number of observations that were fed into the reducer total, for, for this uh, key at least. Um, and then you do r dot, oh, sorry, did that wrong. It's r. And then you do r dollar unique. So suddenly, this, this relatively small amount of code like, that all of this is, if you just want to do trace file processing, this is something that, that actually works. I mean, uh, like, try and think of another tool that you could go out right now and grab that does traffic processing that could give you that answer that, that quickly. I, I don't know of any. I mean, maybe there are, but um, it's kind of neat. I mean, you, so you can start to see these various hosts that did total and unique and, and all of these different things that were done. And it was calculated just by this little thing. And it, it would actually be easy. This one I, I wouldn't recommend because unique takes up a lot of memory, potentially. And uh... Johanna, I've got a question. Is it HLL unique? And is the, the output field HLL unique, too? Oh, what the hell? We'll give it a try. So, if, if you do think that uh, the unique, which uses a lot of memory, is taking too much memory, you can actually change that to be a probabilistic value. So I think that this is, I think, look, we just changed to using a probabilistic data structure <laughs> instead of an exact data structure. Maybe. Hey, look at that. Oh, <laughs> worked. Oh, wait, are our results going to be the same? Hey, we got the same, wait. Oh, wait, no, 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 there is. There's one difference. 343 and 344. That's the error we just encountered. <laughs> that, there, there, so that output is wrong, right? The, the exact output was the one above. 343 is correct. I'm not even sure how they got 344. No, actually, it doesn't make sense. Anyway. But that's how hard it was with some stats to change to something that, let's say, if, if a host has 10,000 unique URLs with the previous one that we had just done unique, it's keeping all 10,000 of those, dom sorry, domains. It's keeping all 10,000 of those in memory, which is not great. But with, the one, with what we just changed to, which gives you a little bit of error, and you can look into it further and see how much error it was. Um, with that little bit of error, we suddenly said, now we don't have to keep any of those 10,000 in memory. There's none of those stored in memory anymore when we move to the hyperloglog -log unique. So suddenly, this might be something you can run in production because it's not going to crush your memory. You're not going to be able to have an attacker maybe come in and scan, you know, do DNS requests 
and fill up state tables because they can only fill up so much at this point because hyperlog log data structures are allocated at the beginning and they don't grow. Yeah. Can you uh, collect samples with that? Yeah. Um, so hyperlog log. Can I get a little bit of help again? What was the, the reservoir sampling thing? What's that called? Huh? No, 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 no. That, I'm not talking, I'm talking about reservoir sampling. <laughs> the, the thing on Wikipedia, the reservoir sampling. <laughs> okay, okay. So we can, we can actually, this is going totally off the, uh, the, the thing, but I think this is much more fun to do this. Um, sample. So what we're actually saying now is that we want to we wanna sample, and I don't remember off the top of my head how to use this. One second. Now you get to see me not knowing what I'm doing, having to look up documentation really quick. Oh, now I'm looking for sample. Num samples, that's right. So there's actually an argument at the end, I believe. No, I don't, actually I'm not sure where the argument goes. Do you, do you remember where that goes? <laughs> this is one of the things, we need, we need more examples of these sorts of things because um, if, if you know how to read it, you can actually do this, but no, I haven't. Sorry? That's right. We'll say number of samples is five. So when we actually, so now we have attached a new calculation We've attached, an, we've attached a new calculation to, uh, I'm trying to get this formatted so you guys can read it a little easier. So we've attached a new calculation to our reducer. We're saying we want to do hyperloglog -log unique, which get, you don't have any of the values anymore. But now we're saying we actually want to go and sample like five of those. And it, it does a, um, a mechanism called reservoir sampling, which is a statistical, it's essentially trying to get a real sample. It's not getting like just the last five. It's actually occasionally like grabs a sample, but it, it's a, it, there's a mechanism for doing this that I did not implement. <laughs> but anyway, so it, um, it does actual statistical sampling of the event stream that came through. So it doesn't change anything. But the difference is that now, let's say we print R down here, so it's, it's going to print out a lot of junk again. You can see that there is a samples field. So let's do R dollar samples. So now suddenly, this is a new field that magically showed up just because we told it to, to do that. So we have all those things. So they're in, a, they're in a set, so we'll actually go and iterate through them. So if I do four... Um, for name and samples, whoa, that messed up. So for name and samples, we will do print, and we'll add some space at the beginning. So this will this will indent it some, and then name. So now when we run it. We, we actually index into the table <laughs> samples. Oh, wait. And that's going to, let's just say I. I thought that was a set, but it's a, okay. Crap. One more thing. So don't feel bad. If you go through this process like this, you're not the only one. So now we, we've actually said we want to sample. So that was, 
you know, answered your question in just a couple of minutes. And this gives you the ability to say, I really want to limit my samples just to like four for each one. And, and you're not getting the last four. You're getting somewhere through, spread out through the stream. So it could be the last four, but that's statistically unlikely according to how it's, it's collecting them. Yes, 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 I can. So that, that's a good point, actually. He, he asked if I could print the confidence. Because now we're using a probabilistic data structure, so it's wrong. Like, you can't trust it anymore. But we did. We looked at the difference between the exact version and the, the other one. So it's nice in some sense because we do get some error there, and it's not perfect. But now let's go ahead and see what the, uh, the error rate is. And I'm going to have to look up how, what that field is that stores that. Um. <laughs> we don't have the error margin for hyperloglog, -log, do we? You can set it, but you can't retrieve it in the output results. Is that correct? OK, so, so that's right. I forgot that hyperloglog -log is a little different. For the top K one, you actually have per result the error, the margin of error, the, or the, the, what's it called, lemma? No, not lemma, what the, epsilon. You have the epsilon, which it gives you the, the um, margin of error. For, for hyperloglog, -log, though, ahead of time, you specify your, the margin of error you would like to achieve and the confidence you would like to have. So right now, our mar and I'm probably saying stuff wrong, so don't take this for too much. I'm, I didn't implement the core stuff on this, and I'm not that mathy, so. Uh, the margin of error, though, that is specified by default is 0.01, and the confidence requested is 0.95. What these are going to do is the data structure, so the, the hyperloglog -log data structure, if you say, I want 99% I want confidence, your data structure is going to be bigger. If you say, I'm willing to accept 20% confidence, your data structure gets much smaller. So actually... Uh, HLL confidence. Let's go ahead and reduce. I don't even know what's going to happen here. Let's reduce that to really low. HLL confidence equals 0 0.20, right? So we've now said we're okay with 20% confidence. Like we, we really just don't care about these results, but we're, we're interested in not using too much memory. And I suspect it's still going to work pretty well. I, so now the one that, remember, 344 was exact. Or sorry, 343 was exact. It was off by one, whichever way the exact and, and the old one was. Now it's off by quite a bit more. It's, it's now 302 instead. So you, know, you can definitely see that we've said we're OK being more wrong. And so now we are more wrong. Unless, wait, I'm sorry, is this the one that, this, this is the one that was like that. So now we are, we're a little bit more wrong, I think. I should, actually, you know what? Let's go ahead and do unique and, um, and probabilistic. So mm, So now what we can actually do is print out um, the exact thing that we measured and the probabilistic. So I don't know what unique. So now we'll do So we got six, you got right. Here's one where it was off by one the hyperlog log. And, and this remember I didn't change it, so it's still a twenty percent confidence interval. Um, 167 unique, 168 exact, 100, 130, oh, 344 unique, 343 exact, 90 unique, 90 exact. So this data set is not causing too much problem. Yeah, yeah, this, this is not, this is just playing around. And what, it, what it, this is actually nice playing around this way because I think it does kind of represent that this is something where you can make these small changes and, and get results that this stuff is hard to measure. Like with most things, this kind of data would be sort of tough to pull all together and, and measure. And it, this is running 
not on a cluster, but it would work on a cluster. Like you could run it distributed all over the place and it would actually still work. You're going to start running into load issues if you're doing like, like this type, this much stuff. So you kind of have to think about how much you're collecting. If you're just collecting a number, like a, a sum, then it's really easy. But if you're collecting unique and, and sample and hyperloglog -log unique, it's just a lot of data to, to pull together. But so far, I mean, I haven't even gotten past the first example yet, but it's kind of neat that, that you know, we've, we've just moved and moved and moved through these things, and we, you know, we've now tested kind of the, 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 the confidence interval. What, what was the other one, the, um, uh, the error margin? What is it by default? So it's looking for a 1% margin of error. Let's say that we're, <laughs> let's say we're willing to accept a much larger margin of error. Let's say we're willing to accept a 20% margin of error. Now you can see all of our numbers are starting to be off a bit more. 95 unique, 90 exact. But the data structures actually for hyperloglog -log are getting smaller and smaller. They should be. Is that correct to say that? They should be pretty small doing this. So, you know, it's, it's this trade-off. You're saying, I'm willing to sacrifice exactness for memory. And in most cases, I mean, how many people look at their network traffic and really honestly believe that they're doing everything perfectly, that they never miss a single packet, that every session gets analyzed perfectly? That there's never edge cases in some weird network path, in, in some weird use of a protocol that, that fails. That one packet that your network engineers told you, this is a backup link over here. It's only like if the main link goes out, then you'll see traffic on it. Do you really believe that? Because it's not true. There, there will be traffic that goes over that other one. I had that experience where they were like, well, I mean, yeah, there's, there's about 300 megabits per second that goes over that one, but it's only for, like, backup. And it, nothing's perfect, and this, this allows you to, to make that decision for yourself and make that trade-off and say, you know, um, I'm willing to accept some margin of error because I recognize that nothing I'm doing is perfect anyway. I can accept the margin of error and make something possible that would have not been possible previously. So let me, there was another exercise that I wanted to, to, to hit, and I've got 10 more minutes, so I don't, I don't know how far we'll get through it. The top K one is kind of fun. That, that was another example. Maybe we can just add the top K into this. Forget it. We're not even going to go on to the actual exercise. Let's just add top K into this. <laughs> it sounds a lot more fun that way. And I, I'm not sure what I'm doing either, so we'll see where it goes. Um, so let's, let's just measure everything. Um, so now we have some stats, top K. Yay, now we're measuring top K. But we run it. It's measuring top K for all the DNS, for the, the top 10 DNS, or sorry, it's, I forget what it is by default. It's probably top 10 lookups per host making DNS lookups. But we didn't do anything with it, so we don't see any result from that. Let's get a result. Um, so we'll say top 10 names looked up for some host. I need to make that format string and then put the key in there so it'll be key dollar host. Okay. So now after that, now I think we want to go into a for loop. So we need to actually create a vector of some stats key. And th this is copying some code out of exercise five out of the exercises for this section that I'm mostly not doing. Um, so we create a vector of, that's wrong, a vector of some stats observations. Now into that, we get, we call this function, because we had to do some tricks internally to get the top K stuff to work. So we do top K get top 
and then we give it the top k result, and we say 10. So we're actually requesting this magic top k data structure to get 10, 10 values out of it. When you calculate top 10, you usually actually internally want to calculate top 100 because it is probabilistic, and it, you get a better result if you calculate a larger top, and then you really maybe only take the top 10. It just gives you a better result it, at the expense of some more memory. Um, so anyway, we now have this data structure S. So we do for I in S. So now we're in a loop, and we're really just looping over them. And this, this is a little goofy, actually, because I think it still returns more than 10 to you. So we're just going to do if i equals 10, we are going to break out of this loop. So we're really, we're really very explicitly saying, hey, we only, we only want to do 10 and stop after 10. But now we're going to say that, let's indent again, and the name is percent %s. And we'll actually, we'll add in the estimated count. So it's, it's showing you the top 10 names requested, but you kind of want to know, like, was the top 10 one, like, 1,000, and then the top one, 1,000, and the next one, 100, and the next one, 99? Like, it's, it's kind of good to know that. So, but this only, this only provides an estimate, and this is where the epsilon actually comes in, and it tells you kind of how correct that number is. But I, we'll maybe skip over that for now, because I only have a few more minutes. So estimated count. So now we actually want to print the name. So we do s index in to, to i, because we're working through that, that s uh, vector. Um, and then we get the string. So that actually gives us the DNS name that was looked up. Now, this, this is a little goofy. There's, unfortunately, the top k stuff, uh, interface-wise, is, is just kind of goofy compared to some other things that we have. But um, it is top k count, r dollar top k, and then the top k value. Okay. I think that's it. I'm mean, amazed if there's no syntax errors or anything. Oh, I forgot to end the parentheses. <laughs> oh well. But now, so. And that took a couple minutes. I basically just translated code directly off the paper that you all have anyway. Um, we actually just measured the top names being looked up. So, so this host, we, so we, we, this is all the results. So this is sort of the epic ended, and this is our results. So we say, this host did 430 total and 381 unique with, granted, we fudged with the, the confidence intervals and stuff. Um, for 343 exact DNS requests in the last six hours. Here's the little sample that was requested. And then we actually have the top 10 names that were looked up and estimated counts for each of those. And I, I mean, that was half an hour of work. But the, the hardest part in this is what is your question? I mean, the absolute hardest part, what do you even want to know? Because answering the questions is actually pretty easy. There's, there's not too much to it. I mean, yes, I, I'll admit that the syntactically, it's, it's kind of rough if you're not familiar with the language. But most people can kind of hack their way through stuff well enough so the parser <laughs> agrees with you and, and gets something working. Because there are examples. And um, so if you can muddle your way through it, this is the kind of stuff that you could you know, build things. That, but the hardest, the absolute hardest question is a asking the question, what do you want to answer? And, and actually coming to an answer for that. The process of answering the question is frequently not bad anymore. So I think I'll go ahead and end there. And are, are actually questions. Are there questions? Yeah. Right there. Thank you. So one of the possible uses is baselining your network, right? Mm -hmm. So one question that I have is if we wanted to compare traffic from, say, Wednesday 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. to last week's Wednesday 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. So, so for that kind of baselining activity, um, Bob had kind of identified when he was talking that it's not something you do with some stats. 
I, I think. I mean, there, there was some subtlety, I think, to your point that you were making, and I don't want to misstate it, but um, that's the kind of, th what, what I think you're asking then is essentially something that could be built with some stats. So you essentially identify your problem, and some stats provides, essentially, the output of some stats provides the input into whatever you want to build. And yeah, I definitely think that kind of thing is possible. There's a number of sort of libraries that I want to build around some stats that are specific to these tasks, like what you said, baselining. Maybe like, you know, is some particular traffic the same at this time that it was at this other time? Um, yeah, you, you could definitely build stuff like that. It, it's difficult. You know, nothing, no, no base functionality like that. It ever seems to be easy. I guess a follow-on question is, for instance, in Python, you can store you know, data as a pickle or whatever, right? Is store, there, store data what? As a pickle. Uh, oh, can, as a pickle. Okay. Right. Okay. Not necessarily the best way of doing it, but just as a sure. toy example, right? In Bro, is there kind of an equivalent where you can basically say store this um, some so, stats my baseline? So that's, that's been a really long-running issue. Um, there is a mechanism for storing data, uh, kind of along the lines of what you're asking. It's this persistent attribute that you can apply to values in Bro, and it will magically save the disk and magically read it back in. Um, it's been a really bad thing for a long time for a number of reasons. And it took a, I think it took a long time for us to kind of identify exactly why it was so bad. Um, I talked yesterday about broker, and part of, uh, one component of broker is a distributed key value store. And I believe that, that ultimately that will be a persistent thing so that if you restart bro, you, is, if you agree to broker's key value store data model, it frees you to say, hey, I can put stuff in this key value store which solves a couple problems. I don't even know if John is in here. Persistence is one of the components of the key value store. It, it will be. Okay, it will be, yes. He's, that, that was it. He just, <laughs> I just needed to ask him a question. Oh, I'm sorry. But, but so once that happens, then what you'll be able to actually do is say, use some stats to, to get some input for me so I can sort of get these values for this time range or for some time range, get these values, do something with them, store them in this thing which solves two problems, makes it persistent, and makes the data available to other nodes in a cluster. So it's, it, it's, it's just been, typically there's very long time periods because uh, it's, it's just hard to do these big distributed system things, but there's typically several features that have to dovetail in, but it, that's just yet another one of the places that I think will slowly add functionality until it smooths speed bumps and um, makes it possible for you to do things and think certain ways when you're writing bro scripts. Because yeah, I, I would be able to write that probably pretty easily. Well, easier. <laughs> Not easily, easier. If you know, I had the ability to just say, well, you know, store it in the key value store and be done with it. That sounds awesome to me. So yeah, I, I totally agree with your point and that, that is something that we're concerned about and working on too. Yeah. Um, with HLL uh, unique, how are you selecting the, the values that are returned by the sample? Um, it's using reservoir sampling. You, you can look up. It's, it's a, it's come, it came from the statistics community in like the 60s or something. Okay. Something and, like that. But yeah, it's a, it's a mechanism. So say you have, again, a billion, a, a, a list of numbers with a billion elements and you go, you're walking through that one time, and you don't know how many there are total, how do you get a statistical sample of that? Without, like the, my, <laughs> embarrassingly, I'll admit, my, my first, the first implementation of sample is now called last. What it did was it had the last four things that were put in. Sure. Johanna went back through and said, let's do, let's make it sampling, <laughs> so that that's at least correct. And now, now it does actual statistical sampling that is magic or something. So do you have an opinion on layering top K directly on top of HLL unique and, and just so you got an absolute top K out of that sample size? Um, well, HLL unique does cardinality, so it tells you the number of unique values. Right. Um, you have the total number, the total number of observations through num because it just tracks the number of observations that were put into it. 
Now if you do HLL unique, you have an estimate of the number of unique values. And then top K is just telling you here are the, the, the ones that were seen the most. So they're actually like, it's, it's really two completely separate. Yeah, yeah, understood. But if you were just saying, okay, for, for a given sample set, show me the top values in this sample set and understand that it's C to the um, pants. Would it be a good or bad idea just from yeah, the way that it's implemented? I haven't played with that a lot, but there are probably ways you could layer some stats where like the output of a sum stat could go into an observation. Right. Yeah, that, okay. that should be possible. Sure, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, just, uh, I guess, uh, future looking question, or maybe it already is supporting of this. Can you do complex keys for storage on some stats? Can you give me a concrete example for like, what you want to do? Um, IP comma port, for instance. Um, I wish. I, I, I actually tried to get that in for a long time, and it, there were some implementation details that were tough with that. And um, the way I would probably do it right now is actually store, uh, I'll type, that'll, instead of talking, that'll be a lot easier. Um, I think right now when I'm doing an observation, what I would probably do is something admittedly kind of hacky. And I think you could actually extend this and make it work. But you could do host string and then like turn, turn the port into, um, It turn the port into a string, and then on the other side, turn it back into a port or something like that. It's it's sort of suboptimal. I think you could I think you could do that, but yeah, you can have more complex uh, keys okay. with multiple values. And as a user, without modifying some stats, you can actually add new fields to this type that this is defining. It's the this record constructor here is actually this type some stats key. Um, and you can actually add your own fields in your own script to that type. So you could say, like, add a port field in it and then fill in. Like, then, you know, you could, once you added that to the type, you could actually, like, maybe have $P and then just assign a port there. And then when you get the key down here, you would have that port available to you. Okay. And then related question, is there the ability to um, hierarchically store information in some stats, so you want to keep a, ver a variety of different statistics associated with a particular IP, for instance. So like in the DNS, maybe you want to see queries, um, and you want to see responses, or... Um, you can attach multiple reducers. So we could actually have another reducer that measures something totally unrelated, and then attach it in here. Attach it to the same key. And then you have your result, and you, you grab which... The thing that originated from which event stream you can get, it, it took a probably embarrassingly long time to come to this design, but it's neat because it does. It gives you the ability to say, like, oh, I want to measure something that is in HTTP and something that's in DNS at the same time related to the same host. Okay, and yeah, that works. Any other questions? Cool. I guess that's it. <laughs>